Assalamu alaikum, everybody. This is Salam Amriyadi, Muslim Public Affairs Council. And uh, we're really uh, eager to have this conversation. I, I think it's something that we should have had a long time ago, uh, but be that as it may, uh, we are now um, convening uh, the various uh, groups, uh, whether they've endorsed or they're supporting without an official endorsement, um, the three um, campaigns that are vying for the Muslim uh, vote. Uh, so rather than endorse, Muslim, the Muslim Public Affairs Council at this time has made a decision not to endorse, uh, but will work with uh, the campaigns uh, to give them access to the Muslim community and let their voices be heard and, and basically let the community vote their conscience, uh, whichever way they uh, deem uh, fit. And I have to say, I've never met a Muslim where I told them how to vote and they 100% agreed. They would always tell me, well, you know, there's something else that we have to talk about. So uh, we've learned in the past that uh, an endorsement is not the only way. Of course, there are groups that endorsed and we'll talk to them about that uh, and see what benefits to the community will come uh, from their endorsements. But first, I want to jump right in uh, with uh, Brenda Abdel Al and Nasreen uh, uh, Barghizi, uh, who are working with the uh, Kamala Harris campaign. And uh, Brenda and, and Nasreen, if you can just start, why why Harris? Why, what are the benefits to the Muslim community for voting uh, for Harris? And and if we if we can stay away from because the other candidate is bad or is worse, but really what what is the the proactive approach in supporting your candidate? Thank you so much, Salam, for having us on here and for the opportunity to speak with um, a really important community that I have respected and admired for many years. I'm Nasreen Nabarigzi. I lead the outreach to Arab American and Muslim communities. And, you know, straight into it, I'll just say that the vice president is somebody who is deeply concerned about the ongoing war in Gaza and in Lebanon. She is somebody who has been very clear in her own actions of working to meet directly with Muslim and Arab American communities throughout this war. And she has also been clear throughout this war that she wants it to end. She's somebody who has met with our community members both during the war, but also previous to that. She has a 20 year long, 25 year long history of working closely with the Muslim community. She's somebody who has worked shoulder to shoulder with folks in California. And when she found her way to DC, the very first bill that she sponsored as a US Senator was to provide access to counsel for folks caught in the Trump Muslim ban. So she's somebody we've worked with for many years. She's deeply concerned about the same issues that we're concerned about. Um, the war is something that she has leaned into deeply, especially in these more recent days, and is trying to find the solutions that will result in dignity, freedom, and self-determination for the Palestinian people. Now, I can give you a lot of information about different things that she's said and done and folks that she's met with, including meeting with people from the Palestinian American community who have lost family members in Gaza. She's met with doctors who have come back from medical missions. She's also, in more recent days, met with Muslim and Arab American leaders in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, Governor Walz has also met with folks in Wisconsin. So these are folks who are really attuned to the issues and concerns of our communities. And, you know, she's a really strong leader. I'll tell you as somebody who has spent the last four years working for her, I was her deputy counsel from day one of the administration, working with her on a variety of different issues. She is an incredibly strong person who cares deeply about people. And she works very hard to understand what's happening in any given situation and to come to a fair and thoughtful result in those situations. So this is a person who has a vision for America and her vision is she wants to one end this war. Um, and then she wants to create an America where all of us can get ahead and not just get by. And that means she plans to address price gouging. She plans to address access to housing and home ownership. She plans to address small businesses and um, how to develop more of those. She also wants an America where our access to reproductive health care and other health care is protected and amplified. 
and she wants us to live in a world free of gun violence. So this is the person who she is, and I think she is the right person for our community. Brenda, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, Brenda, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I would like to add something, Salam, if that's okay. And Salam alaikum, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be among so many friends um, and to be here with you all today. Uh, I think one thing that Salam has always championed at MPAC is the power of representation and engagement. And working for this administration and the commitments that Kamala Harris and uh, Governor Tim Walls have made in a future Harris Walls administration is to continue the representation of Muslims and Arab Americans in, um, in government. As many of you know, we had a historic number, over 100 Muslims that served in this administration. And Governor Tim Walls on the Million Muslim Voter Call um, that our dear friend Gula here had moderated with the governor had continued, had, had said that he is committed to continuing that representation. And as many of you know, we had, um, that includes Senate confirmed positions, first time ever having Muslim federal judges appointed um, and confirmed, as well as Arab Americans. We had a historic number of over 40 Arab Americans that served in this administration, um, many of which were also Senate confirmed. So this is historic as it comes to representation. And that is something that will continue for all of us. And that also allows for continued engagement. As someone who ran an office for partnership and engagement at the Department of Homeland Security, the power of your voices is so critical and having those opportunities to engage with a government that works for you is so important in this moment in time, regardless of the topic. And with that, back over to you, Sana. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Brenda, and definitely stressing the point of representation and definitely a lot of progress in the Biden administration for that. But back to what uh, Nasreen was referring to in terms of the Gaza uh, uh, genocide and uh, now what's happening in Lebanon. Um, I, I don't think that the community feels that uh, either Biden and or Harris, um, and she has not separated herself enough on that issue of Gaza, because while there's rhetoric about calling for a ceasefire, there's continuing shipment of arms to Israel. There is a perceived uh, appeasement uh, of various pro-Israel groups in Washington, and even a risk of losing the Muslim and Arab vote in Michigan uh, out of that appeasement. So how do you respond to that criticism? Yeah, Salam, I would just point you to a couple of recent items. Just two weeks ago, the vice president sent out a message about um, the blockade in northern Gaza um, and the fact and reality that people there are starving. And in her message, she was very clear. She said international humanitarian law must be respected. That same day, the Department of State and Department of Defense also sent out a letter to Israel making clear that these violations would end up triggering U.S. and other laws. And so there, I think she's been clear about what she expects. And I think we have to give her the opportunity to become president, to be able to implement the things that she has put out there as areas of concern for her. I will also say in regards to Lebanon, she is one of the first people who came out very quickly, um, noting her concerns publicly about her concerns around civilian casualties, her concerns around the humanitarian situation. And they very quickly announced, I think it was over $150 million in aid to help with the humanitarian crisis that was going on. And they also ensured that there was access to temporary protective status and DED status for folks who are living here in the United States. So I think, you know, if you look at her record in terms of what she has power and control and ability in, she has always shown up and she has always been somebody who has been a thoughtful leader in this space. I will also just say, you know, as somebody who is from Afghanistan myself, somebody whose family has like lived in bombardment in the past, these are all experiences that I have shared with her, um, both including my own family's experience, but also including what is and is not supposed to be happening in a refugee camp and some of these other issues that I think is just so hard for all of us to see, right? Like we look at these videos and these photos every day of people being burned alive in a refugee camp in a hospital setting and it's excruciating. And I want you guys to know that She's seeing those images and those videos as well, and she has the context that we have. I think we need to give her the opportunity to lead. Thank you. 
Uh, Brenda, you know, when you were first announced to be working on the uh, campaign for Kamala Harris, uh, there was a hit piece on you uh, going back to your college, day, college days, talking about pro-Israel influence in Congress and calling that anti-Semitic, even though Benjamin Netanyahu himself has been caught on video saying that he and, and the Israeli government controls the U.S. Congress uh, and, and the White House. So how do we deal with that nexus of is Islamophobia, which I believe the, uh, the Biden administration is supposed to come out with a strategy on dealing with that, the nexus of anti-Palestinian racism and anti-Muslim animus? Thank you, Sanem, for, for raising that. Um, so the first thing I'll say here is that it wasn't too long ago that many of us would remember that any whiff of controversy would lead to someone um, quietly having to exit their position or their role. I was really proud to work for a campaign that um, that stood up to my record on uh, working with the Jewish community as well as working with the Muslim communities on combating anti-Semitism in all of its forms and the work that Nasreen and I both um, did at our respect in our respective roles in combating anti-Semitism. And so really proud that um, this is a campaign and uh, hopefully a future administration that stands by, um, you know, the American Muslims and, and can recognize smear pieces for what they are. Now, as it relates to students, um, you know, we often say the vice president is of a different generation. She grew up uh, going to civil rights marches with her parents. Uh, she often talks with great pride um, about the, um, the work that her mother and her father had led that allowed her to, you know, from very young age, be exposed to the right to protest. And one thing I will say is that um, in, each time that she is interrupted at any of her rallies, she immediately says, this is an important part of our democracy and the right to protest is a right, um, is, is, is a fundamental right of, of Americans. Doesn't give the right to interrupt, but it does give them the right to protest. And so she does constantly reiterate that. Um, so I did just wanna uplift and highlight her record as it relates to um, growing up as part of the civil rights movement. Uh, one last question from the audience. There was a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Ahmed Ghanem reportedly removed from an event uh, with uh, the vice president and, you know, in, in the campaign. Um, something similar happened during Obama, where two women in hijab were removed. Yet President Trump uh, seems to not have a problem standing with Muslims and, and gaining their endorsement. Uh, how do you explain that, you know, seeing that the Democratic Party is supposed to be the party of inclusion? I mean, I'll just say we um, very much embrace our, our Muslim community. I was the vice president's um, lead on Muslim and Arab American community issues. We organized the first Eid al-Adha celebration in American history at her home where over 120 leaders attended. We have had so many engagements over the last four years that I can't even name them for you. But in regards to our campaign, just a few days ago, we had um, an Arab American leader in the Michigan community provide um, remarks as part of the program for the vice president's rally that she was having. We have had um, folks in North Carolina do the same. We have engaged with having the vice president meet people. She was in Philadelphia this last weekend on Sunday where she met with leaders in the community there. Those pictures are out and about. I think you see some of the Trump pictures and things profiled because people are stunned that anybody would support the president, the former president, given his record. And so I think those things end up getting quite a bit of play um, because it's got a shock value to it. This is the man who passed the Muslim ban. And yet you are seeing folks in the Yemeni community, one of the communities that was impacted the worst by the ban, standing up there with them. So it's the shock value of it. Have we engaged? Have we brought the Muslim and Arab American community to our events, to our programming, to the vice president's home, to other places? We absolutely have, and we absolutely will moving forward. On Dr. Ghanem, I'll say, you know, when we found out what had happened, we immediately looked into it and realized that that shouldn't have happened. It really shouldn't have happened. And so we reached out to him and we apologized for the misunderstanding. And we told him that he was welcome to all future events. 
We also immediately issued a press statement to that exact same effect. So if Muslims are not welcome, then I don't know how I'm getting everywhere that I'm getting with her. And okay. the other thing Thank I would you, just man. add here, Sanam, yeah. if I may, um, yes. we have endorsements from all segments of the American Muslim community across the country. We have, you know, I think there's now two letters of imams across the country. We've got multiple endorsements from Palestinians, Yemenis, Syrians, Lebanese, you name it. Um, they have come out and supported the vice president and the vice president strongly on the basis of her record of support for this community. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time and very val valuable information. And we will remain engaged and in, in, um, we wish you uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Alaikum salam. Uh, next, uh, I want to invite uh, Ubay Shahbandar, uh, who runs a PAC uh, for America um, and um, is based in Washington, D.C. Uh, while he's not a representative of the Trump campaign, he definitely supports President Trump and, and uh, is definitely in close contact with all the uh, officials working around uh, uh, the former president. Um, uh, Ubay, I, I think the same question to you that I posed to the, the folks from the Harris campaign. What is the gain for American Muslims in voting for Donald Trump? Salam, everyone. It's great to be with you. Yeah, I work for Ambassador Rick Grinnell, also who is President Trump's uh, foreign policy envoy. And look, there's a reason why here in Michigan, where I am right now, um, have been for the past few months, why you've seen you know, the sites recently um, that have been... Um, incredibly public with the president bringing Muslim American leaders, Arab American leaders with him on stage with the most recent one being in Novi, Michigan, where he's received their full endorsement as the candidate for peace, um, where it's been, where you've had held dozens of meetings across the state uh, with Muslim American groups and Arab American groups and the wider Middle Eastern community. And why the, the feedback that we've received uh, for President Trump and the enthusiasm that we've seen um, is largely in reaction to the failed four years of the failed policies and the, you know, the misery, the war, the destruction that have been ongoing for the past you know, four years. And people want to see a real way forward, a real new way forward. And in order to achieve that, you need a break from the Biden-Harris administration. And that is what uh, the president is offering the American public and the Muslim American community. And, you know, when you see Imams from places like Hamtramck and from Dearborn um, and from you know, Warren, Michigan, going out on stage endorsing President Trump. They're doing it because they see that their only way to break from the past, from the failures and from the death and destruction that have been ensued as a result of the Biden-Harris administration is to bring in real leadership that stands for peace. And, you know, in addition to, to the foreign policy issues, what we've been hearing here in Michigan on the ground from the Muslim American community is real concern with Department of Education policies that have been um, put in place by the Biden-Harris administration that are widely viewed as pushing a radical gender ideology that are pushing parents out of critical decision making for their children in schools. And that is a real major factor and a real concern for Muslim Americans across Michigan and frankly, across the country, particularly when they see the efforts by the um, this administration's attempts to rework things like Title IX to criminalize so-called misgendering to essentially push parents out of any discussions on gender in elementary schools. And that is a real, real concern for traditionally conservative, socially conservative Muslim American and the wider Arab American you know, community in Michigan and, of course, in other other states. And the message from the from President Trump when he sits down in these roundtables with uh, Muslim imams, with Muslim community leaders, uh, with uh, with Muslim Americans across the board is that he will bring peace. He is the one that can achieve what uh, President Biden and his vice president have failed to do in the past four years. And we've seen real a real opening by the Trump campaign to Muslim Americans. Um, and not only in the outreach to the to the to our community, but also for the inclusion um, in po the po future policy making decisions of you know people like me. One of the reasons that the uh, the, the Trump campaign has wanted to really highlight just how important the Muslim American community is, 
uh, for uh, for the campaign and for the president and for the future administration is by bringing in people like me into the fold. And it's what we've been seeing um, on the ground. And again, most of, I've spent most of my time here in Michigan is that people want a real change. And people see President Trump, now they may not like all of his rhetoric, but they see him as somebody who tells it the way it is. And that is something that the Muslim American community who is sick and tired of this, uh, being just given the scraps from the table by the Democratic Party establishment, they don't want to be treated like infants. They want to be treated like adults. They want to be, and they want a seat at the table. And that is something that uh, we've seen here by the Trump by the Trump campaign, saying that we will give Muslim Americans a seat at the table, and we will offer them a real break from the past four from the past four years of failure that uh, Vice President Kamala Harris fully owns as somebody who, by President uh, Biden's own admission, is uh, completely in lockstep with the Biden-Harris administration's foreign and domestic policies. So now, you know, while it may be, you know, shocking to the mainstream media, you know, narrative that President Trump is not only meeting, but getting endorsements from um, a number of Muslim American groups, and by the way, not only here in Michigan, but by national groups like the Pakistani American a political action committee um, and by the Syrian American community you just posted their endorsement um, earlier today. And that is a reflection, I believe, of a real trend here that the, uh, in viewing President Trump as the only real viable solution to get us out of the mess that we've seen these past four years. Um, you know, Obey, I, I, uh, two questions. One, uh, on the issue of, of Palestine and Lebanon, the genocide there, the destruction of Lebanon. I heard uh, Dr. Uh, Imam um, uh, Zuhair talk about how President Trump wants peace, not war. But how? How is he going to achieve it? Because he's been quoted to as telling Benjamin Netanyahu, "Just get this over with. Go ahead and wipe them all out." Um, so it's it's not that you know that we 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 uh, we're it's not the issue of peace, but what kind of peace? What kind of situation? Uh, what's the vision? For achieving peace in the region, look, President Trump is somebody who can make deals. We've seen that with the negotiations with the Abraham Accords, which, by the way, um, President Trump has real leverage over Bibi Netanyahu that Biden and Harris are simply unwilling or unable to use. And we saw that with the Abraham Accords, um, actually, where um, you know Netanyahu was forced to accept many provisions that he did not want to accept. Um, and Trump's message is very clear that he can bring um, all the sides to the table and bring a, fi a final, a ceasefire deal to end the fighting. Now, are we gonna be op offering any specific policy blueprints at the moment that I'm privy to? I'll be very honest with you, no. But the message here from you know the Trump campaign and from senior Trump policy officials who will be senior officials in the future administration is that you need a leader who's willing to use the leverage offered by the great power of the American presidency uh, to bring all sides to the table and to uh, put pressure when pressure is needed to stop the killings. And we've seen a number of public statements by the president saying that he will bring peace. He will put an end to the fighting. And he's somebody that is not afraid to twist arms behind the scenes and to use the power of the, the office of the president. And we've seen him in, that, in the first term use that power on multiple occasions to bring, for example, negotiations between you know, the Serbs and, um, and, and Kosovo and the Albanians, and where he's, you, in fact, with his envoy, um, Ambassador Rick Grinnell. And that is the type of negotiating ability and the, and the uh, willingness to use pressure when it, uh, to bring all sides to the table to end conflicts can be brought forth to the second Trump administration, and that uh, we believe that it will is the only viable solution to end the fighting, to end the the destruction and the, the horrific killings that we're seeing in the Middle East. Look, we've you, four years. You had a chance for four years of this administration to believe that all of a sudden now we're going to have a, a new opportunity under somebody that was part of this failures of this administration to not uh, put any pressure on Bibi Netanyahu. It, you're simply going to have a, somebody who does not have the ability or will not be taken seriously by any world leader. President Trump will be taken seriously 
deadly serious by people like Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and Bibi Netanyahu, who are hard players on the world of, of the stage of geopolitics. And that's something that the other candidates simply will not be able to offer. Um, on the issue of getting, giving Muslims a seat at the table, what what kind of seat are we talking about? Because this is the president who uh, first thing he did in the first day of office as president, the executive order uh, for the travel ban uh, on, on Muslim majority countries. So you have on the one hand, you're saying that he wants Muslims to have a seat at the table. On the other hand, he called he he actually signed into order uh, a Muslim travel ban. Right. And just to clarify, that was a part of the policy for extreme vetting, for you know, uh, ensuring that people that 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 legal migration remains the policy, but that um, anybody coming into the country um, from certain countries goes through a certain level of extreme vetting to ensure the national security of all Americans, including Muslim Americans. Um, that it is not banning Muslims across across the board. So there is a separation between that when it comes to uh, visitors and uh, migrants coming to the U.S. and offering Muslim Americans a real seat at the table um, in the in the future Trump administration. Look, there's a reason why you you have people like Dr. Masad Boulos, uh, who is the father-in-law of, uh, of of Tiffany Trump, you know, President Trump's daughter. Um, who's been heavily engaged with the Muslim American and Arab American Middle Eastern community. Of Ambassador Rick Grinnell, who's been tasked directly by the president to sit down with groups as small as 10 and groups as small as hundreds uh, with Muslim Americans and the Middle Eastern American community in Michigan. And those ties that have been built in the, uh, in the past few months are going to continue into the future Trump administration. And that this is why this election offers such a historic and unique opportunity for Muslim American voters to be kingmakers um, and for them to ever be taken seriously by the Democratic Party establishment after what's happened the past four years, we I believe that they have to send a real loud and clear and historic resonating message that they will uh, be a voting bloc that will help put uh, President Trump back in the White House for four years. And that will allow serious strategic leverage with the Democrats and with the Republicans in future election cycles. And uh, again, you have people like me and there are others uh, that are working very closely uh, with Ambassador Rick Grinnell and with Dr. Masad Boulos. And it is really a historic opportunity for Muslims to change and impact policy, both from the inside and from the, and from the outside. And we're making a clear pledge to all the Muslim American groups that we are meeting on the ground in Michigan and other battleground states that our line will always remain open to you. Um, there have been several ads that I've seen from the Trump campaign uh, talking about how Hamas is here. Rudy Giuliani, Giuliani spoke about that at the uh, New York uh, convention at Madison Square Garden. He refers to American Hamas uh, and anyone who protests uh, against what's happening in Gaza is, is going to be deported uh, and labeled as, as Hamas. What, what do you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, Rudy Giuliani does not speak for the president. He had a, an early speaking slot at the Madison Square Garden um, you know, event. And I, Rudy Giuliani says a lot of things. Does that mean it's going to be that he is speaking on behalf of the president? No, absolutely not. Does it mean that that is somehow the policy of the future Trump administration? No, absolutely not. A lot of people say a lot of things. What you have to look at are the statements that have been issued by the president, including uh, those from yesterday that he wants to push a true peace to end the war, not just a ceasefire, but to end the war um, that we're seeing in the Middle East and in Europe. That Those are the statements that really matter. And we've seen, and the fact that you have Dr. Masad Boulos, Ambassador Rick Grinnell meeting with the communities, that is where the focus really should be. Yes, you're going to have people like Rudy Giuliani, but look, that we are changing the game. You know, Muslim Americans be involved in the Trump uh, campaign and in the future Trump administration. Um, frankly, there are people in Republican circles, conservative circles, don't like it. And we are changing the game by, with our direct involvement uh, with the future policymakers of the, of the Trump administration and making it clear to the president that he has real support amongst Muslim Americans and Arab Americans with the grassroots. And that is going to help propel him back into the White House to change uh, to uh, uh, as, as a real counter to the, the horrific failures that we've seen in the past four years. And I think that message is going to resonate historically for years to come. 
Uh, real quick, we're out of time, but I, just, I need you to comment on the issue of parental rights, what's happening in schools, and uh, your your statement about parents uh, being taken out uh, of counseling. Can you elaborate on that? Because yeah, absolutely. I don't think, yeah, I think some people view that as more fear mongering uh, against. No, the, it is it is not fear mongering because we are hearing it from everyone, from uh, Muslim American Muslim Americans uh, families here in Michigan, particularly with the Department of Education's attempts to. Uh, uh, rework Title IX, where it will become a criminal offense to not use the right pronouns in the schools, to where uh, certain cer certain public schools are, be told, are telling parents that they um, do not have a say on how their child, their child uh, perceives their gender. And so this is a radical restructuring of, of of gender perception and gender ideology at the elementary school level. And we're seeing it in multiple public schools. And in Michigan, there was that's why we've seen this uproar from families. It's essentially pushing parents out of key decision makings, uh, decision making of their the future well-being of their child and the schools and the government putting the uh, the schools at, uh, before the parental authority. And uh, that that concern and that fear, and it's not fear-mongering, it is re a real fear based on new uh, new policies being pushed down all the way from the uh, Biden-Harris Department of Education, is really spurring, uh, I think, a change with you know socially conservative Muslim American uh, communities, particularly in Michigan, where it's been felt the hardest. And look in California. I mean, you could be potentially prosecuted for using the wrong pronoun in schools or misgendering. And essentially, this is something as a Syrian immigrant, as an immigrant from Syria, where I remember very clearly our parents, you know, to this, to this day, as a child, our parents telling us the walls have ears and be careful what you say, uh, you know, in school, because the government, the regime will imprison your parents or will imprison us for what you tell teachers. And that is the future that Many, you know, Muslim American immigrants do not want, you know, for them, for their families and for their children. Yeah, let's let's all work for freedom of expression and the First Amendment, because I, I feel it is being compromised uh, during this uh, conflict we're seeing in, in the Middle East. <laughs> but thank you very much, Ube, uh, for, for your comments. Really appreciate it. Good luck to you. And we'll be in touch uh, after the elections. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, now we turn to Dr. Jill Stein, uh, the the candidate uh, uh, running for president. Um, Dr. Stein, thank you again uh, for thank joining us. Good to see you again. We spoke uh, you know, a few months ago, and um, it's good to have you on on our program here. Uh, Dr. Stein, if you could just say in a few words why Muslims should vote for you. Muslims should definitely vote for our campaign. Muslims are very much a part of our campaign. My running mate is an American Black Muslim. Uh, we are very much uh, in support of the needs and the rights of the American Muslim community and Muslims around the world, uh, in particular in Gaza, where this genocide is being um, inflicted on women and children and innocent civilians uh, in an absolutely horrifying and terrifying way. Our campaign from the get-go has been the only national scope campaign, which is anti-genocide, anti-war, pro-worker, and pro-climate action. We are the one such choice on the ballot. And in this election, um, the American people are very hungry for such a choice, for other choices, in fact, beyond the parties bought and paid for by Wall Street, by APAC, by the war profiteers who are very much calling the shots, as Dwight Eisenhower warned uh, many years ago that the military industrial complex would take on a life of its own, which certainly it has. And, you know, both uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are very much uh, on the receiving end of those dollars, including from APAC, which has Congress by the throat and which has locked the American people out. The American Muslim community and the Arab American community has very much been on the receiving end of an extremely misguided U.S. foreign policy. This goes way back. I myself grew up during the Vietnam War and saw what both parties were doing in Vietnam, basically murdering uh, millions of uh, Asians for no reason whatsoever. And I myself was loathe to be a part of either 
uh, political system that was bought and paid for uh, by Wall Street and the war machine. And, you know, currently we have seen a whole series of wars committed uh, against the people in the Middle East, where according to Brown University Cost of War Project, it's at least 4 million people who've been killed in the process of these wars, which remember began uh, in pursuit of weapons of mass destruction, which uh, did not exist uh, in, in Iraq. Um, so, you know, the Muslim community has very much been on the receiving end, and so many American Muslims are basically refugees from uh, extremely misguided and aggressive U.S. foreign policy. It's not only Muslim Americans, it's most, it's many, many migrants themselves uh, who are refugees from uh, misguided U.S. foreign military and economic policies, economic colonialism, as well as, well as the militarism. Um, so American Muslims have not only seen and experienced U.S. foreign policy, but also have seen the abuses of empire here at home because this endless war machine uh, is robbing us blind, consuming half of our congressional budget uh, against you know the will of the American people without the knowledge of the American people. Uh, and we here in America are paying the price. Uh, the average household, according to Jeffrey Sachs from the Columbia University Economics Department, the average cost to the American household has been $12,000 uh, this past year alone for uh, the cost of this endless war machine. And again, because we are spending half of our budget there, uh, we do not have the dollars that we need right here at home to pay for the emergency state of health care and housing and education and the debt that so many young people are locked in in uh, college debt, as well as the climate crisis. And in fact, we saw just recently where the Biden-Harris administration rewarded uh, the Netanyahu government just after its expansion of this genocidal war into Lebanon. Not only is Bibi Netanyahu basically given whatever free reign uh, he wants to conduct whatever uh, genocidal expansion of his war and horrific massacres that he's undertaking. Uh, not only is he constrained, but he's actually rewarded. And after the latest expansion of this war into Lebanon, you know, killing uh, thousands of people and injuring uh, many more, uh, you had the U.S. committing some eight or nine billion dollars worth of military aid, again, you know, on top of tens of millions of dollars in military aid uh, to Israel after it's even expanding the war in the most horrific fashion. And currently we have, you know, we're on the verge of this, well, this war is expanding. It is a Middle East war to protect Israel's right to commit genocide. The baton for Commander in chief has been handed over to Bibi Netanyahu. This is an outrage. The American people are intensely opposed to this. This is why the Democrats, in particular, it's the Democrats uh, who try to silence uh, political opposition, have tried to throw us off the ballot, have taken us to court to have to defend the right of the American people to have the choices that they have been clamoring for uh, for a very long time. So, you know, so the effort has been to suppress us, to fear campaign and smear campaign, because the Democrats, uh, you know, know that their pop their policies are extremely unpopular. They don't want to talk about their policies. They need to uh, scapegoat. Uh, their political opposition. So we have the benefit of the majority of American people that wants to end the genocide, uh, a majority, over 60% of Americans who want an immediate weapons embargo. Uh, the president has only to pick up the phone. You know, if we turn the White House into a greenhouse and make the world a safer place on many accounts, uh, the very first thing that we would do uh, would be to stop this genocide. But we have more to do than simply stopping the bombs and the missiles, uh, opening up, of course, you know, the food and the water and reconstructing the housing. Uh, that aid alone isn't going to do it. We have to end the occupation, the ethnic cleansing, uh, and the basically the apartheid state of government uh, in Israel that is, um, you know, uh, conducting a murderous way of life, whether whether the genocide has been in full swing or not, um, this is you know unacceptable. Uh, the the world um, is opposed to this. Uh, the American people are opposed to this, and very much want the benefit of the resources to be put into the state of emergency here. And I'll just make one more comment, which is that in 2020, one out of every three eligible voters chose not to vote 
for the uh, for this duopoly, this endless war machine duopoly that is throwing the American people under the bus. So the American people are ready to be mobilized and to come out in huge numbers if we can get the word out. And by the way, the non-voting uh, eligible voters are lower income of color and lower income, exactly the people that our agenda, to, our agenda speaks to, which is the agenda that the American people have been hungering for. So whether we win the office or we win the day by engaging a coalition that will be here for the long haul to stand up for our basic values as American, to stand up for our right as Americans, to decide our future together, not to have it bought out from under us by APAC, by the war machine, by the big pharma, you know, the big money that has bought and paid for these uh, two uh, political parties. The Green Party is a people-powered party. We don't take that money. We disavow it. We disavow the super PACs. We are of, by, and for the people. Uh, a time has come for a sea change uh, in the public, um, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the options, in the political options that are made available to us as the, as, as the public. It's not only the, uh, the massacre taking place in Gaza. It is uh, an extremely um, dangerous and misguided foreign policy. It is the climate crisis. It is the war on working people. It is rising fascism under Democrats, as well as threatened under, under Donald Trump. So we have every reason to stand up and know, as Frederick Douglass said, power, um, power concedes nothing without a demand. We must be that demand. And as Alice Walker said, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it in the first place. We do have that power. And the uh, the objective is to organize our numbers and to put our solutions to work. We are the ones we've been waiting for here for the American public. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, wh what about the genocide in Sudan and and what's happening to the Uyghurs in China? What, what, where's What's your position on those two? So, you know, in, as far as Sudan goes, yes. You know, I mean, this is a horrific uh, genocide. Um, and it must be uh, addressed. And the U.S. certainly plays a role in ginning this up. Now, we are not paying for that genocide. It's We are not arming that genocide. We are not defending that genocide, uh, you know, with taxpayer dollars and with our elected officials. So it is not kind of at the front and center, but this is very much an issue we have, um, you know, we have spoken to and uh, will continue to um, to outlet, to lift up this. You know this also begs to be addressed. And likewise, the condition of the Uyghurs is very much of concern. You know, here in the U.S., there has also been an effort to uh, you know the the China phobia and the effort to demonize China to gin up war with China and economic competition. So as Greens, we are uh, quite mindful of the um, you know of US interference and US efforts to uh, create conflict. So there's been a lot of skepticism about you know the condition of the Uyghurs and I think this very much needs greater clarity. Uh, you know now that I've been very engaged with the Muslim community, I'm hearing uh, reports from so many people you know, who can attest to the abuses that are going on of the Uyghurs. And absolutely, you know, we oppose those human rights abuses and we'll be looking further into this. Uh, you know, I believe, what should we say? You know, there is no greater abuser of human rights uh, worldwide than, you know, my country. As, as um, Martin Luther King said, my country is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. So, you know, in my view, it's very important that we, uh, you know, that we have some understanding and knowledge of what's going on here because it's our government that, in fact, is in perhaps the biggest hot seat of all. Uh, and this is our genocide in Gaza every bit as much as it's Israel's genocide. You know, so there's a lot of accountability to go on. Um, there's a saying that uh, uh, that all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. So, you know, this goes along with uh, big empires. So, you know, this may be the uh, the dark side of, of China. And it would be no surprise to me if this, you know, uh, turns out to be completely true. Uh, at the same time, you know, it's, it's very important that we not allow this to uh, to allow negotiations to break down uh, with China. Um, you know, and I feel the same way about Putin. You know, Putin is conducting a criminal war. Thank you.
Yeah, um, go ahead. Last question, because we're running out of time. I apologize for that. Um, there's that criticism that a vote for you is a vote for Trump, uh, that you're taking away votes from uh, the Democrats and, and the Harris campaign. How do you respond to that criticism? Uh, and while many people agree that the two-party system has many deficiencies, if, if, if not rigged uh, in many ways, to prevent third-party candidates, other candidates from uh, being placed on the ballot, um, what what's needed for third-party candidates, uh, other candidates like yourself, what threshold is needed to make progress in, in breaking that monopoly uh, for the next election cycle? So this accusation that a vote for our campaign, a vote to end genocide is a vote for Trump? I don't think so. You know, this is very self-serving propaganda, and it's really important to just discard it. Any politician that's telling you that they own your vote and that you are somehow you know, uh, you're you're a criminal if you don't accept the marching orders from the political parties that have thrown you under the bus, that are murdering your relatives, uh, that, you know, have allowed you to be targeted in this country. Um, you know, this is absolutely absurd, and it doesn't deserve the time of day. Uh, we have basically two greater evil candidates. Uh, if you vote for the lesser evil, you know, thinking uh, whoever you think is lesser evil, uh, you know, um, you're essentially endorsing genocide, you are affirming genocide, and you are enabling genocide with your vote. Do not be talked into supporting or affirming genocide. And um, a vote for our campaign is a vote to stop genocide. It is a vote to build the power of democracy and a politics that is of by and for the people. And yes, we have a long way to go. That is a sign of how incredibly corrupted, how tight the stranglehold of oligarchy, big money is in this country. But we, the American people, are also playing uh, to the teeth here. So we have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Any uh, politician who tells you that they own your vote, you know, in my, consider in my view, doesn't even deserve consideration of your vote. Politicians have to earn your vote. Kamala Harris could go a long way to earn your vote right now if she would uh, implement a weapons embargo right now. She won't do that because she would rather uh, lose the election than stop this genocide and this service to Bibi Netanyahu and APAC and the war, the war profiteers. 5% is a huge uh, threshold. At 5%, we are automatically on the ballot in most states, so we don't have to spend the first 10 months getting on the ballot. We can actually hit the ground running and be a contender and a voice of opposition to genocide and empire and rising fascism and all the rest. Uh, we can hit the ground running in the next presidential race. We also get a big pot, um, some 12 million, but perhaps more than that. Uh, doesn't sound like much for the billion dollar campaigns, but we're a people powered campaign. So we can do much more with uh, far less in the, in the way of money. And this will be more dollars than we've ever had to help jumpstart a political campaign. So this is not only about this moment, seizing the moment. This is a perfect storm for political transformation. The Democrats, you know, this is the first time they have ever felt the need to actually take out an ad against a third party against us, which I regard as an incredible badge of honor. And if you look at social media or look at YouTube, watch the uh, Breakfast Club or any of the other platforms, which are not green platforms, they're not Muslim platforms. If you look at the commentary on these efforts to smear us and fear campaign against us, you'll see that it's just, uh, uh, it's creating an upsurge of support for our campaign right now, demanding an America and a world that works for all of us. Uh, we can do this. We can create such America if we stand up with the courage of our convictions. And I thank you so much for this opportunity thank to you. talk and look forward to working with you in the future. Jill Stein, com. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Stein. I really appreciate it. Good luck to you on November 5th. Um, and uh, we, we, we hope for your success and uh, we will be in touch um, after the election. So thank you very much for your time. I look forward to working with you for the long haul. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now we turn to our community uh, partners. Uh, first is uh, Salima Saswal from the Black Muslim Leadership Council. Uh, and Salima, uh, I know you endorsed the uh, Harris campaign. What what is going to what do we gain as a community? What what guarantees did you receive from the campaign for that endorsement? Well, when we decided to endorse, first of all, Asana Thank you for having me on, Brother Salam. Thank you. Um, 
When we decided as an organization, the Black Muslim Leadership Council Fund, which is the C4 arm of the Black Muslim Leadership Council, when we decided to make an endorsement, it was it was pretty um, soon after the uh, president endorsed uh, Vice President Harris to be the um, nominee. What supported our decision was the fact that we felt that one, she would do the best job out of the candidates um, to protect um, to protect the the rights of our community. Um, she has a proven track rec track record. Um, and we looked at we lo we looked at the fact that in terms of Gaza, she has um, repeatedly called for a ceasefire. She has expressed empathy towards the preservation of civilian life in Gaza. Um, I mean, there are a number of things during during the, where she has shown sort of empathy um, in, 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 in that she wants the war to end. She has been working to end the war in her capacity as vice president. But also I, I feel that, you know, she would do the best job at, at you know, approaching an end to this war um, the safe return of hostages and 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 the 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 rebuilding of Gaza. So, um, in looking at these issues, however, Salam, we didn't only look at a single issue. Um, um, we looked at other policy issues. As an organization, before Black Muslim Leadership Council launched, we drafted not only a domestic policy agenda but also a foreign policy agenda. Our foreign policy has demands related to the genocide in Gaza, but also it speaks about Syria and Yemen and 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 Myanmar. You know the Uyghur Muslims, um, you know Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan. You know we 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 looked at other places as well and, and spoke specifically to the issues that were taking place, the genocide that's taking place, and what could be done to remedy those um, situations in other parts of the Muslim world. We also look at domestic policy. A lot of Black Muslim Americans, and you know, Black Muslim Americans make up the largest proportion of the American Muslim community and have been here since the transatlantic slave trade. And so we are also um, definitely focusing on issues such as education, healthcare, affordable housing, economic opportunity, um, environmental justice, social and criminal justice reform. We're, we're looking at other things, voter suppression. You know, um, we're, we're looking at um, other policies as well and, and balancing, you know, wh wh who is the individual out of these candidates that we think is viable and then that will do um, the best job at supporting the needs of our community universally. And, and for us, that was uh, Vice President Harris. Thank you. Uh, and joining us also is Mohamed Gula with the Engage. Uh, also, I think Engage PAC or Engage Action endorsed uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, Mohamed, what what do we get for that endorsement? What what's in what what are the what's that return on investment for the American Muslim community? Hey, Salam alaikum. Uh, all you know when the return on investment for the Muslim community is really looking at all of the options that we have in ensuring that the conditions that we have passed November 5th are conditions that are well enough for us to actually work towards ending the genocide, but also continuing to build the power, to build upon the power that we've been able to accumulate over the years. A lot of people will say, what power does that look like? There are a lot of successes that we've been able to see in just this year alone. We have never been able to have any sort of ceasefire resolution that we have in building the allyship that we have in Congress where, yeah, we have 18 that have co-sponsored, but we also have another 80 plus who have called for those ceasefires. So our endorsement and our recommendation was built on the conditions that are needed for us to advance the movement in general. And so when we're looking at different opportunities of what it is that we're trying to achieve, whether it be uh, what we're trying to achieve post November 6, I do not, to be clear, I do not accept this idea that if you vote for the lesser of two evils, you are affirming, endorsing, supporting genocide. I think that that is a disingenuous minimization of all of the work that we've put in all of this time as a Muslim community, nor do I believe that uh, uh, a third, the uh, a vote for the third party ends or stops the genocide. When November 6th comes, it's either Trump or Harris that's going to be in, in, in the administration. We could have looked towards the past four years, what has been built in the third party. I personally really appreciate the candidacies and the rhetoric that has come out of it. I have, I do 
appreciate the vision. I appreciate the respect that the issue has brought with that has been the foundation of the party. However, as an organizer, as someone who makes their decisions and provides their recommendations based on the conditions that we have today as we build for tomorrow, I'm going to give an honest assessment because that is my amana that I have to be able to provide. And the honest assessment was an assessment that was going to be an unpopular assessment that I really hate to be able to, to I hate to to have to, to share, but there is an amana that comes with the position and the responsibility that I have been given. So when I ran the numbers of what it looks like to get 5%, with all due respect, looking at the looking at the turnout, that means that we're going to have to get 8 million votes. When I look at the numbers in 2016, um, there is no third party option that got 5%. Um, when we're looking at the Green Party, it got 1.4. When you're looking at Gary Johnson, he got 4.4, I believe. So seeing the pathway of, of being able to get that 5%, being able to get that 8 million votes, I just didn't see that either. So even when we're looking at punishing the Democrats, even when we're looking at punishing whoever it might be in the Republican side or wh whatever we're looking at, the, the, the actual numbers of how we get there, the pathway to victory, the pathway to change is not clear across the board. So what I bet on was our ability as a community to come together um, and to be able to advance the movement and what we've been able to do in just this one year. When we saw the abandoned Biden movement, I will not speak against the abandoned Biden movement. Why? Because we needed abandoned Biden to get uncommitted. And without uncommitted, we wouldn't have fractured the party. And without fracturing the party, you wouldn't have had a Biden, uh, uh, you wouldn't have had President Biden drop out of the race. And so when we're looking at the achievements that we've been able to bring together, um, I, I'm, uh, this recommendation is a bet on our community to come together, but it's also a recommendation that's based off of the reality that Trump doesn't come to office alone. It's the reality that at the end of the day, we have Speaker Mike Johnson, who, who is leading with the Republican and GOP um, uh, uh, majority, who has already tweeted out to our institutions, putting them on notice, telling, letting them know that we're not only coming for the IRS for your, for your 501c3 status, but we're also coming for your ability to even protest. And so I'm just believing people as they are, and I'm looking at strategy and seeing if if the pathway is actually what they say it is, and it's not. So our recommendation was all based off of that. Thank you. Uh, I want to turn to Mahmoud Harmoush. Uh, Mahmoud, can you can you unmute your phone? Okay, Mahmoud, uh, are you with us? Uh, I cannot hear Mahmoud. Uh, okay. Can, can he be, is he with us, Muhammad? We're, we're going to check on that. Okay. Uh, let's go to Osama Jamal. Uh, Osama, you're with the, uh, U.S. Council on Muslim Organizations, USCMO. Thank you for joining us. Your decision was, uh, basically it's an indirect, not a direct, uh, saying that you, we should support candidates calling for a ceasefire arms embargo, uh, on Israel for the Gaza genocide. Um, and while many people agree with you, that pretty much puts you in the camp of voting or, you know, if I were just a common person and hearing that, I would I would conclude that I should vote for Stein, not for Harris uh, or for um, um, Trump. So what what's the benefit of issuing that statement to the community? First of all, thank you for the invitation. Number two, correction for the third time. I am not here on behalf of U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations. We are C3. You cannot represent that organization. I'm here on behalf of U.S. CMO CAN, Civic Action Network, which is a C4. My, my apologies. Uh, I hope this correction be made clearly and yes. repeatedly. Uh, um, let me say this. Um, first of all, I'm very thankful for uh, the task force uh, organization who spent um, extensive time uh, vetting and discussing the candidates, uh, looking at their uh, positions and how much that uh, will relate to the Muslim community. Um, I think what we are going through this genocide uh, is unprecedented in the 21st century. I think uh, this is playing a major role and the community's decision, we like it or not, we understand the facts, we understand the realities of elections, we understand the reality at the end is going to come down to either Republican or Democrat, 
one of those would be in the in the in the White House. Uh, but the genocide is bigger than any of, of that. It has affected the community extremely, especially. It is still ongoing. It is not stopped. We're not talking about the past and what the candidates would have said in the past. It is still going on and none is willing to stop this carnage from happening. Um, I think the community is extremely upset. And I think um, uh, Kamara Harris or, or Trump, neither one has made a reasonable um, a, a statement that will alleviate the worries of the Muslim community of what's happening in Gaza and even in, in the United States. It is under the watch of, of the Democrats and especially Biden that our students got uh, mistreated, uh, denied their first right uh, uh, of, of, of freedom of speech, uh, attacked in campuses, uh, some of those campuses have been even uh, denied them graduation. So we we gone through a lot. So you cannot blame the community from taking any uh, of their position at this election. It is a tough time for the Muslim community to make a, a decision of of their uh, you know that that makes sense uh, for what is happening. Um, it is a difficult situation, and it was difficult for all the member organization and the task force. Um, we we discussed it thoroughly. And we thought this would be the best uh, position to give because again, we don't want to fracture the community. Our community is smart enough. Our community has been involved. Our community and local, some organization national, they claim this and that, but I think they are way away and absent from the reality on the locals. The locals are very engaged. The local are voting, registering to vote, and they make good decisions on the local. And the locals who are uh, uh, electing, uh, you know, our state representative, our, even U.S. representatives, mayors, and, 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 and others. So um, I think we should give them a credit for that. What is happening here is that uh, we left it for the Muslim community to make their own judgment. We have tried our best. And certainly the guiding decision for us is to stop the genocide in Gaza. Um, I think uh, uh, Kamala Harris had multiple occasions and opportunities to, uh, uh, to, to, to make a good statement and, and to, uh, to support a ceasefire. Uh, she had an opportunity at the uh, Democratic Convention to bring a Muslim to the stage uh, uh, to be able to speak. Um, she denied that. She refused that. Uh, she kept repeating lies about what happened on October 7th. Although the media has debunked those uh, 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 news that she kept saying, and she doesn't need to say that again because no one is going to hold her on, on something that was already lies. Um, she did not come forward. So uh, I don't think she should blame the Muslim community or this organization, that organization, Kamala Harris, if she fails and if she loses this election, she has to blame her own self and the campaign advisors who did not give her a good advice. In my own personal view, I think they want her to lose this election. I think if they were smart enough, they know this election is going to come to a couple of states, you know, on those swing states, especially in Michigan. And she should have, they should have advisor to say something that at least would make the, the, the voters in Michigan to come forward to her. Um, Donald right, Trump, we know you. who's Donald Trump. We know his past, uh, uh, you know, yeah. four years and day. So we we made conscious decision to help our community. And I think what our position now, especially USCMO can, Civic Action Network, uh, is we want our community uh, to go out to vote. This is our strength. This is the vote that we want to make. This is the message we want to say send out. Uh, all politics are local. We want you to engage locally. We want you to come out in thousands, unprecedented thousands, come to the vote. And, and to this election, regardless of who you elect and who you choose or not to choose for the presidential uh, ticket, but at least go to the voting uh, uh, polls and uh, cast your vote, participate, because at the end, we want to make sure that Muslim votes, at least if not this election, we are setting the stage for future elections. I know that, that we do need to see a third party come to the elections because that is going to make America even better than what it is today. Unfortunately, the American people have not given true choices uh, to, to, to make one of them uh, because of the way the system works. So 
regardless of what, I think we made a conscious decision. I thank my, um, you know, uh, uh, counterparts and these uh, organizations who made their best efforts. And the statement we went out there does not endorse anyone other than the principles that we stood by. We need a ceasefire now. We need to stop arming uh, uh, Israel with the bombs. And unfortunately, it is easy for them to send bombs, but not easy for them to send humanitarian aid. This is a shame. This is a, this is a clear genocide that is fully supported and made the United States complicit, especially the Biden administration, fully complicit in this genocide. And the American people and the Muslim American community and the world will not forget what Joe Biden did uh, before the days of his departure. Thank you. Um, just also uh, a correction. Um, uh, Kamal Harris did invite a Muslim to the stage that, you know, uh, Dr. Yusuf Islam, uh, the uh, city councilman from uh, from New York, who was part of the Central Park Five, was on stage. And I believe there was also an imam who gave a prayer. I think what you meant is um, she didn't invite the, the Palestinian state representative yes. from, right. from Georgia. To, to um, bar, um, bar with the with the with the families with, with of the that. of the uh, right. hostage still. Uh, back to back to then, uh, Salima. Yeah, you know, how do we deal with this issue that we have so many different parts of the community? As you mentioned, the African American Muslim community is the largest part. Um, do you consider um, communities talking about Gaza as departing from American issues, or is this an American issue? How do we how do we navigate that so that we don't further fracture the community? That's a good question. I don't think that in in focusing on Gaza, you have to, de, de, you know, I don't think in focusing on domestic policy issues or in focusing on Gaza, you have to depart from either, you know, um, issue of po e either um, categories of policy. Um, I, I, I think that the balancing of all of these things is more powerful than just, you know, being being a single issue sort of community. Now that's just my opinion. Do we have to prioritize? Yes, I do think that there, there is a, ne a, a, a necessity to prioritize issues, but I don't think that we should just just only solely focus on on one issue. And 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 again, I don't think that one has to be at the expense of the other. I think that this can be collaborative and and, and universal. Thank you. Uh and Mohammed um you know, getting involved in politics uh, usually comes with uh, uh, quite a, a, a burden. Uh, part of it is being attacked by your own community and a lot of misconceptions. I know Engage has had to deal with that. I'm going to give you this opportunity to uh, comment on on these attacks against Engage. You know, uh, Brother Jazakallah Khair for that question. I'll tell you this. I, I, I don't blame the community. I think that um, Brother Usama Jamal had expressed it perfectly with everything that we are experiencing. We knew when we made the recommendation that um, the community it would be an unpopular decision. We knew that folks would be upset. But as I mentioned, the the amanda that we have and the role that we play as a PAC, as a C4, the number one thing uh, that's a part of our theory of change is to organize, to build power, to move our movements and our issues forward. And there are outcomes that we try to achieve. And with those outcomes, um, there's a, a way to do it. I always try to uh, live by this quote that says that you have to operate within the world as it is, as you change it but what you want it to be. And so we're trying to operate in the world as it is while not accepting what is going wrong and saying that it is right, uh, but rather acknowledging that it is wrong, but continuing to engage. We're gonna continue to vote every single year. We're gonna continue to organize every single year. This wasn't the first year that we've made endorsements. In 2020, we made endorsement, we endorsed Bernie before we endorsed Biden. And, and the reason why we did that was to make a statement, but to also acknowledge the realities that this is where that this is the vision that we're working towards. When we're looking at Andy, Representative Andy Levin, who also joined us at MMV, we were defending him in his position as a pro-Palestinian Jewish American. And when we were organizing with him, we knew that there were investments from APAC and others in the pro-Israel lobby to remove him. And the same thing happened with Representative and Congresswoman Marie Newman. And then we were talking about 
now we saw Corey Bush and Jamal Bowman. So there's always going to be people who disagree with the, our approach, and that's perfectly fine. I respect it. I love my brothers and sisters dearly. Even when we're talking about a third party, um, and we're talking about extending, uh, expanding democracy, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the investments that are needed. I will be more than happy post-election, post a presidential election where we know that we can't win that election. I'll be more than happy to work with the third party to look at what look running for local offices and winning local office looks like, what winning state office looks like, what winning a congressional office looks like. Those are the conversations we should be having, having to advance a movement. But instead, what we're talking about is how do we run as a president and how do we win as a president? And we're giving this pipe dream that we know that it just isn't going to happen without a clear pathway to victory to do it. That's not something as an organizer and as a strategist and as an expert in the field of organizing and campaigning, I'm not going to accept that. And I'm not going to lie to my people in my community and tell them, hey, this is what's going to happen. Whether my community is upset with me about that or not, uh, I, I understand. And I don't blame their frustrations. We're seeing daily our children being killed and bombed and 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 dehumanized in many ways. And then we're seeing our institutions being attacked in many ways. So for us, it is very natural, very natural for us to feel the passion that we feel, to feel the anger that we feel. But what you will never see is me ever in, in our organization, at least, will never put another organization down or say that they're wrong, or say X, Y, and Z, that the work that they're doing is wrong. And the final thing that I'll end because it's come up on multiple occasions is is the DNC. I, the only thing I want to correct is that there weren't just one or two Muslims that spoke at the DNC. There were five Muslims that spoke at the DNC. I was at the DNC as well. And my sister, I think, uh, uh, mentioned that she was also at the DNC where she had the, the, the banner as well. But I'll tell you this. When I was when I was there with Uncommitted and they were doing their thing and they were standing, there was also a hatha that was created by IMEU, a kafia. And I was wearing the kafia and I was wearing the Not Another Band thing. And I could not walk 10 feet without people who were asking me where I got that from because they wanted it. So when I'm talking about the investment and the recommendation of building within the spaces that we've already built, I'm talking about, and there was data actually that came out and said that 80% of Democrats uh, support uh, the pro-Palestinian movement and the pro-Palestinian narrative. So when I'm saying our recommendation was based on people who were already our allies and wanting to move this movement forward, it said that 80% of Democrats agree with us. We are investing in that 80%. We're not worried about the 20%. The 20% we're going to continue to chip away at. But I'm not going to throw away my 80% because I'm mad at my 20%. That's just not going to happen. So when we're talking about the trajectory and the focus that Engage has and the recommendations that we provide, it's not that we're ignoring what's happening in the world. No, it's that we're acknowledging what's happening in the world and we're staying focused on continuing to build that movement as we have done since 2018 with Andy Levin and Rashida and every other pro-Palestinian person who has run. And at the same time, making making adjustments and making taking on a lot of the disagreements that a lot of people have said. We haven't always had it right. We will never... Had it right. okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, lastly, uh, and we'll start with you, Osama. Um, you know, I used to be part of a group called American Muslim Political Coordinating Council, and Aga Saeed, the late Aga Saeed, God, Allah uh, um, uh, had had a wonderful saying: "Is that we all have a unity of purpose with a division of labor." And then also the late Dr. Mar Hatut, Allah Hamu, said. Unity is not conformity. So how can we leverage each of our strengths? So you have Salima and Muhammad who are inside the, the Harris campaign. You have people who are now inside the Trump campaign. You have people who are now inside the Stein campaign. How can we leverage it so that whoever wins, we go to that person or that group and support them to hold that candidate accountable for the promises that were made in getting our vote. And, and we'll start with Usama. Well, I tell you, uh, we're all guided by our principles. There are principles that are the, the foundation of our actions. And we have to agree to those principles. Um, we're all political savvy. We all been involved. We all been engaged. This is not a new territory for us. Uh, some of us been involved probably before some were born. Um, so we know how America works. We know that uh, the kind of deals that you have to make sometimes, but we always been guided by our principles that are very firm and very uh, uh, clear. Uh, we cannot work with organizations that are 
already uh, declared their 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 support to uh, uh, to our detriment, to our faith, um, to our causes. Um, we cannot compromise on that one, regardless of what. At the end, uh, we live by our own uh, uh, principles. Um, you look at the mirror, you see yourself, and you want to respect yourself. When you when you look at the mirror, we have taken positions. Uh, uh, we know where we 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 uh, how we deal with that one. And this is not the only way that either we do this or or no. I think we have ways that we can work with the system. We can work uh, with with other fellow Americans here, but I don't have to sell out my principles or to deviate from what is very important for me. And I think that's became a fundamental difference. Is sometimes that we have to discuss, and sometimes is the the, the deciding factor to to uh, to deal with others. Um, yes, we can. We we work with you know we work with different organizations. I mean, different administrations. Um, where we've been invited to the White House even during the the Trump uh, uh, time, but we never compromised, and we never came through organizations in a group that they hate us, that they clearly undermine our existence and our safety and our uh, future in this country. We didn't have to deal with that. We went and we worked and, and we would continue to present ourselves as Muslim Americans, patriotic, uh, 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 loyal to, to, to this country's uh, um, uh, best interest. Again, every every group in, you know, in, in Washington DC, as you know, uh, they try to work for their best interests, and that's how they think. And we believe we are working for the best interests of America. Unfortunately, there are so much has been going on that uh, United States, especially in in the in in the in the last uh, uh, several years, they have not supported a single, not a single, human rights or democracy movement in the in the Middle East from the Arab Spring on and, and in the entire Muslim world. It's unfortunately, and I challenged them. I'm really, yeah. thank, thank, thank you, Osama. I'm really sorry, but we have to move on. But I, I think we, we got your, your, your point about sticking to principles and moving forward that way. Salima. Um, I think, thank you so much for having um, us on this program and for establishing this forum. Um, I, I think what you what you um, pose here is a really good question, and, and I hope that it, that will it will be the case that regardless of who wins the election, that as a community, we will heal um, from the division that exists at, right now and that um, we will learn to better work together and, and you know, whoever is in office, hold that person, you know, accountable. Uh, I, 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 I think that. Uh, Mashallah, I, I tend to think that with law wills, we will be able to 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 cope with it and, and that he wouldn't put a, put a burden on us that we can't bear. And so I'm optimistic. Thank you. And and Muhammad, uh, how, how do we avoid the cancel culture where we're not canceling each other out, but we're actually adding uh, to each other? Yeah, um... I think I'm the wrong person to answer that, but no, no. <laughs> listen, um, M Gage, we have uh, an important rule where no matter what happens, we're here to go to battle with our community, no matter what, and for our community. So for us, there is no canceling in that sense. Our door is always open, regardless of what has been said in the past, regardless of what has happened. Um, we do this, we do this for our community and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't we won't put our pride ahead of us we won't put any of that ahead of us in regards to cancel culture i mean look there are things that we know that we have made some difficult decisions and difficult moments and we may not have gotten it right one of the biggest things that um we as a team and we as a uh, as a staff have consistently reminded ourselves is that we need to listen more we need to hit the community more we need to uh, keep our door open more and serve the community more um, and so understanding that the work that we do is a service, um, it's not it's not anything beyond a service for our community um, and, and keeping that mentality and reminding ourselves of that. Actually, as a team, we in, in 2022, we we our staff retreat was was actually at Umrah. We did Umrah together and, and we were able to and, and in many ways it was very transformative because we were able to experience um, the trip to Taif. Uh, or to Taif and to see 
uh, and hear just the history and the realities and the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and what he went through and the companions went through was very transformative for our team in, in the way that we approach service and the way we approach power building and the realities of just what has happened in the Sira. Now, does that mean that, again, that we're going to be perfect? No, but it definitely grounded us in, in understanding that the reason why we do the work that we do is not for us. Uh, and even when people disagree with us, which will happen because it happened to the greatest of men in history, like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where um, even his own companions disagreed with him. And he had the message. Um, and so who are we to believe that people won't disagree with us and won't cancel us? We are not superior to him. We are not superior to, to better men than us and even better men that are on this call who have done this, as Brother Usama had mentioned, done this longer than us. So um, we... That, I think, is a part of the process. We understand that it's a part of the work, but we will not lose sight of the reality of the service that we have to provide, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Mahmoud is back on. I, I, you know, he, he's involved with the Trump campaign and uh, not representing it, uh, but also has worked uh, diligently on the Syrian issue and believes that um, there's a way to help the, the situation in Syria, another uh, forgotten uh, uh, catastrophe against our ummah. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, how do we unite the, the Muslims in this upcoming elections? And I'll let you have the last word, but if you could just do it in just a few minutes because we're way over time, we need to wrap up. Mahmoud, can you unmute yourself? Okay, I guess he cannot, he cannot, uh, Unmute. All right. Well, um, I think as as Osama said, the most important thing uh, for us is to vote and not to take our our uh, power of the vote for granted. Uh, how people decide or what people decide, which way they go, whether they vote uh, for one candidate or the other or the third or neither and just vote down the ballot. It's just the most important factor is that the establishment, the political leaders of the United States see that the Muslim vote is becoming more of a factor, is becoming more influential. And I believe everybody here wants to see that. We have disagreements on which uh, priorities or even how to deal with a priority um, and, and how to uh, politically compromise without compromising our principles. That's the most difficult thing in politics. Uh, but I, I believe that everybody here has the good intent, the good intentions of doing what's in the best interest of the American Muslim community and doing really, at the end of the day, what's in the best interest of America. Uh, whether it's the Gaza war or what we see with the Uyghurs or Sudan or the homeless problem here or the violation of civil rights in our country um, or uh, the issues of, of uh, brutality uh, against uh, the African American community by uh, various uh, law enforcement agencies or the surveillance in, in our country and so on and so forth. These are the most important issues for all of America uh, and to make uh, America not just preach to the rest of the world about freedom and human rights and human dignity, but actually live up to those standards. And that's what I believe all of us are trying to do. And with that, I thank all of you for joining us and whoever wins, we will go to you to see what we can deliver for our community and for our country. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.